Good evening and welcome to everyone to this evening's Behind the Scenes event. My name is Joan Concannon and I'm Director of uh, I'm director of External Relations here at the University of York. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight and particularly the amazing Fatima Manji and also Kate O'Connor who is chairing for us. So before we get started, a few housekeeping remarks. Um, first of all, if your Wi-Fi connection fails, you can re-enter the platform just linking uh, on your Eventbrite ticket link. Second of all, um, we are using the transcript uh, function for those of you who require it. If you find that distracting, the transcript button is a transcript live button is at the bottom of your screen and simply go into that and click hide subtitles. So Behind the Scenes was conceived very much in partnership with our student union, and I want to thank our amazing um, president of our student union, Patrick O'Donnell, for working with me on this. And the idea was really very much in a, a continuation of something that we say to our students all the time at the University of York, which is to try something new and to explore as much as possible in the context of being a University of York student as many new ideas and as many new ways to think about your future career as you possibly can. Um, we've been delighted with the reaction to this series and also to the fabulous speakers that we've had. And tonight is a really interesting, um, on a context of a day of elections, a day where we are thinking about the future of broadcast journalism in a social media age, who funds news, how impartial can news be, what is the role of a modern day journalist, the challenges and the opportunities. So we are really thrilled that Fatima Manji has agreed to speak to us about her incredible career and her observations about the media more generally. I also want to thank and to introduce now Kate O'Connor, who is the co-director and chair of the Partnership Board of um, XR Stories and particularly our Screen Industries Network, otherwise known as SIGN, because you can't work in a university environment without having a good acronym. So Kate, it's my pleasure to hand over to you to chair tonight's event and also to thank in advance Matthew King, um, the editor of one of our um, very frequent award-winning student newspapers, News, who will be along later to give a vote of thanks, uh, reflecting very much that we may not have a journalism school here, but we certainly have lots of students who are interested and want to pursue careers in the media. So thank you and over to Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. And Joan and Patrick, what an excellent idea behind the scenes is. And I'm sure it's really come to life during the last year. Um, and I know you've had some absolutely brilliant guests and speakers um, at behind the scenes to support all the discussions about the careers and the professions that the University of York are interested in and the students are really interested in hearing about. Um, I know I'm so looking forward to tonight myself um, and before I introduce Fatima a bit more formally and introduce her to your screen I'll just uh, say I'm Kate O'Connor, as Joan has already said. I'm an independent consultant. Um, I've worked in the screen industries for, I hate to say, about 30 years now. I was founder and exec director of Skillset, which was the training body for the creative industries, but have worked independently now for over 10 years. And I'm so very proud, actually, to be part of the XR Stories story, the uh, co-director, which uh, XR Stories is all about storytelling and technology and new ways of producing content and SCREEN, um, SCREEN Industries Growth Network, the SIGN acronym Joan mentioned, also run by the University of York. And together, XR Stories and SIGN are going to make sure that Yorks and Humberside isn't just the best cluster in the UK, but is internationally respected and renowned for its storytelling and its screen content. So I'm absolutely uh, honoured and proud to be part of the Yorkshire story. And I can't tell you how um, delighted I am to be able to introduce Fatima Manji tonight. Um, you know, as you all know, Fatima is an award winning broadcaster and a journalist who anchors the UK's Channel 4 News. Uh, and I'm sure you will agree that Channel 4 is not only the nation's most popular official news night, nightly news program, but it's the most challenging and it's the most informative. And Fatima is part of a hugely respected team of people that I think we've all got to really respect, highly credible journalists 
who bring news that's not often covered elsewhere onto our screens, who ask questions not asked by other journalists and by other broadcasters. And to be honest, if it wasn't for this opportunity, I wouldn't be missing my seven o'clock slot um, in front of the Channel 4 News tonight. But I wanted, very much wanted to meet and introduce Fatima, who within that stellar team, is the person who reports on the major national and international stories. And she's best known for breaking stories with a, a global impact. Um, there are so many, you know, including the tale of the Saudi princesses, the displaced Iraqis fle fleeing ISIS, or investigating entrapment in Northern Ireland, or just constantly covering um, the rising anti-migrant extremism. These reports are so necessary, are so powerful, and provide such human testimony uh, behind the news stories that we hear um, and read. But you're not here to hear me talking about Fatima, you're here to meet Fatima and hear her talk about her career choices, her career journey, and what it's like to work um, in such a high profile, highly important journalism role. And so I am absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Fatima to the screen and we will start the interview or actually the conversation because it will be a conversation initially between myself and Fatima, but then we're really hoping that you will post questions up on the Q&A um, uh, uh, function and after a while, I'll try and bring some of those questions in and we'll start to have a conversation that includes you, the audience, as well as myself and Fatima. Uh, and there won't be a presentation, so this is very much um, your opportunity to ask the questions that you want Fatima to answer. So thank you so much, Fatima, for coming along um, tonight. I know you have horrendously busy life and you're often away filming um, but it's much appreciated and um, I, I'm going to just dive in if, if you like and ask you a bit about your um, early career choices because when did it start the passion to be a journalist when did you know you wanted to be a journalist and what or who were the key influences on that career choice? Sure. Hello, everyone. It's really nice to be with you. And um, I hope sometime soon in the future we can be together in person, too. I think we're all looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, so when did it start? I mean, I, I honestly, I decided at the age of eight that I was going to be a journalist. And that sounds like a story that people tell, but I really did. And for me, I it was two things. One was that I really admired the way that I saw journalists on my television screen and in the newspapers being in the place where history was made and I really wanted to be a part of that. The other thing is I saw a lot of injustice around me and around the globe and I thought that I wanted to be a part of exposing that injustice and I really um, believed that um, journalism was a really effective way to do that. Um, and that's something I've always strived to um, focus on in, in my stories and in choosing who we speak to um, because I really believe that um, if there are people who uh, feel that they're silenced or they're unheard, then it's our job as journalists to seek them out. Um, so that's very much the kind of motto that's informed my career. But it was a really, really early um, career choice. Having said that, I think that scares people. And to say, if you don't, you know, if, at the mm -hmm. age of eight, if you don't know what you're doing, it's totally fine. Um, you know, I work with many brilliant colleagues and they've had so many different journeys coming to journalism and coming to TV journalism. So, you know, it's totally fine if you don't know yet. Oh, I think that's incredible. Um, and it is, an, a, a, you know, perhaps an unusually early age to think, you know, that's what I want to do. Um, and was there any deviation from that? Did you ever, you know, think you wanted to do something else at the age of 10 or 12? I mean, was there any deviation? What might have been some of those other options that you might have chosen, I suppose, if you wanted to pursue, yeah. you know, investigation and justice and... You know. yeah, I, honestly, there, there wasn't that many deviations. You know, before I wanted to be a journalist, I probably thought it was a great idea to be an astronaut or something. Yeah. Um, which was not realistic for me at all. I'm not sure I could take those that many days in space. Um, but 
you know, I think one of the things for me growing up is I didn't know many journalists. The only journalists that I knew of were people I saw on television and people who I read in the newspapers. And, um, you know, I remember going past um, my local newspaper office. So I grew up in Peterborough, um, which many of you might know if you ever head down from York to London, it's a stop on the train. Um, and I remember seeing the Peterborough Evening Telegraph offices. And in those days, it was a big office. Sadly, most local papers aren't big offices now if at all. Um, and I remember thinking, God, wouldn't it be amazing if I could work there? And that was my sort of um, closest interaction to journalism. So, I, you know, my imagination of it was very much based on um, a slightly rose tinted view, if you like. Um, and, you know, the reality, yes, it's brilliant, but it also has its difficulties. But I didn't know much about the difficulties. So I think, in a way, I, I couldn't be put off uh, what I decided to do. Yeah. Okay, well, that sounds, that's, that's amazing. And then you went to, to, am I right, you went to the LSE, you went to study at the London School of Economics, yeah. but not uh, anything to do with journalism? Did that reinforce, that, that reinforced your ambition to move yeah. into journalism? Yeah. Yeah, so I studied um, politics and history, or government as, and history, as they call it, the LSE. Um, I spent a lot of time though working at the student newspaper and I know that um, some of you are involved with the York student newspapers so we did a, a weekly paper um, so I guess it was always alongside me um, but I, you know again what I would say is you don't have to study journalism to be a journalist and quite often yeah. the very best journalists I think haven't studied journalism because they bring something else um, whether it's a, a specialism or a detailed knowledge of something else um, and I think that can be really invaluable, actually. So um, I, I'm very much of the opinion that the best things that you can learn about journalism are very much um, practice and experience and learning the skills within newsrooms, um, wherever that is, whether that's a, a local newsroom, radio, newspapers, whatever it is. Yeah. And you follow the well-trodden path, I think, of being a BBC trainee. Mm. That was, and that was your first experience of, you yeah. know, learning the skills of journalism. And, and how formative was that for you? So, uh, you know, I was really fortunate to get onto that scheme because I know that these, these trainee schemes are, are really hard to get onto. And, um, you know, there's very few places mm -hmm. there should be more. Um, and sadly, there aren't enough training schemes for people. Um, but, you, you know, what was absolutely brilliant about it is I started out in local radio. And honestly, you could not get a better training ground. And I remember when I started out, I remember thinking, oh, God, I, I want to come off and work at Newsnight and I want to go off and work at the World Service. Um, and, and you, you know, I knew other people who were doing that. And I thought, wouldn't it be brilliant if I could do that? But local journalism was absolutely brilliant because... A, you are so close to the people that you're reporting on. You cannot get anything wrong um, because you'll hear about it straight away. But you also, you hear, you hear stories all of the time and you recognise actually um, people's everyday experiences are what really matter to them. Um, and it's actually much harder to report um, some of the everyday experiences that we have. So, you know, when people are angry about bin collections, let's face it, that's not the most sexy story. But... Mm. You can make it really interesting if you listen to people um, and you really learn the, the skills of your um, craft. And I think that um, I really did learn those um, at local radio. And, um, you know, it was amazing to work with so many brilliant people um, who I learned an awful lot from just in terms of um, interview skills, the technical skills and listening to people. I think that's really, really the most important thing. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. And in terms of, I mean, it sounds like, you know, it sounds almost like, uh, you know, a seamless journey from education into journalism. Did you ever encounter any barriers? Were there ever any, you know, people saying don't do it or, or you know, were there any issues that you encountered in making that path through to your, your, your first professional role? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, lots of people thought it wasn't a good idea in terms of, I remember um, a family friend to me say, saying to me, you know, when I was quite young, oh no, a journalist is not a nice thing to be. Um, because lots of people do have negative interactions with journalists, let's face it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that put me off, but there, you know, there were people who thought that wasn't a good idea. Obviously, you know, lots of other people thought, well, you're not gonna make any money from it. And I can confirm you, you don't go into it for the money. Um, and along the way, I mean, I, I also applied for lots and lots of jobs before I got there. Um, and, you know, I think that's just it's just part of the journey. Um, and you have to accept that 
it will work out eventually and everyone's paths are different. Um, but that sometimes the path that you think might be good for you isn't, isn't quite right. Um, so I think it's very important to just sort of embrace the journey along the way and not try and rush it too much. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Solid advice. I'm my eyes are darting to the chat room and the q &A, um, bar uh, and there's some great questions coming up but they are jumping to what it's like to work with Jon Snow already immediately and we're coming to that guys as well as some brilliant questions about um, particular stories you've covered but just I just want to spend a, a wee bit longer if I can on you know your career journey and uh, picking up on some of that advice about you know, d determination, but they're not being, you know, a set path and, you know, uh, skills are you know, as much about listening as about all of the other, you know, technical writing and um, investigative skills, if you like, and interviewing skills. But how did you, um, how did you then move from the BBC? What was your next step? And how did you move into Channel 4? So I, I'll get there, I will get there, Mark, in terms of your questions coming through. Um, so I, I moved on from local radio to regional television and I worked at a programme called BBC Look East, which is um, one of the regional TV news night, uh, nightly news programmes that the BBC puts out. Um, yeah. I spent a few years working there, which is where I learned about TV. And, you know, honestly, when I moved from radio to television, it was such a shock because the brilliant thing about radio is it's so immediate, it's so direct, and people will tell you anything because all you're doing is putting a small microphone in front of their mouth and they're quite willing to open up and talk to you. Mm. TV, oh my God, I mean, the, the cameras being there changes everything. And now it's a lot easier because we have small cameras and it can be a lot more intimate, but it wasn't um, at that point. Mm. Just in terms of the technicals, I remember the very first week thinking, oh my God, I wanna get back to radio because you know, you'd have a breaking news story and it would be a question of, okay, well, how do we get a satellite truck there? How do we get a cameraman there? Where's the cameraman gonna park? And the logistics of it, still a pretty crazy I mean it's got easier with technology over the years and you know now of course people can pick up their phones and film something and it can end up on television yeah. um, but I remember the logistics of tv just really throwing me and thinking I want to go back to radio um, and again you know working at regional news is a really again a really good training ground um, I cannot emphasize that enough um, and it, you know the, the sort of local stories that are personal picks to people really really do matter and, and make an impact um, and so I spent several years working there and then I did uh, various other things at the BBC and just sort of dipped uh, my toe into various things, including the BBC World Service. And then after that, uh, I applied for a job and uh, at Channel 4 News and I got it after three interviews and several screen tests. Uh, wow. So, uh, yeah, it um, feels like a long time ago already, but it was uh, 2012 when I joined Channel 4 News and I've been here since. Yeah, okay, you're almost a veteran now of the Channel 4 News team. Okay, okay, that's fascinating. And I think it's really, um, that's really solid advice about, you know, some of the routes in and the, the, the regional, the radio, um, you know, those, you know, not dismissing some of those stepping stones, they're really good platforms to move on and up. So we'll, we'll move on to now, um, just to get a bit more feel for what it's like being a journalist, being a broadcast journalist. So what does a typical day or even a typical week look like for you? Well, I know, I know it sounds a bit cliched, but there genuinely isn't one. Um, it depends on whether I'm working on an on the day news story or a longer film. Um, so for instance, we have a morning meeting, which used to take place at 9.30 in person, now takes place at 10 o'clock on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that's obviously changed recently. And that's um, to discuss all the, the new stories of the day and what we're thinking of, of doing. And lots of people will have been deployed to stories before then. So, you know, if, if you're filming something at um, 8, 8 a.m. or you're outside a court or you've already, you already know about something, you may be outside there filming already, but 9.30 is when our meeting takes place. And then after that meeting, again, people are deployed and the kind of program starts to shape up a little bit in terms of um, the stories that we think we're gonna be covering and the issues that we really want to narrow in on, where we might have a debate and so on. Um, and again, it depends on what I'm doing, particularly on that day. So I might be out on a story um, filming uh, on the day news story I might be um, in the studio that night so if I'm in the studio that night I'll start getting across all of the stories that we're covering so I have them in detail 
um, and probably um, in much more detail those particular interviews or debates that we think we have coming up. Um, and that's how the day kind of proceeds. And then we have another meeting again at 2.15 to sort of go through what's changed. Um, are there breaking news stories? Have we got more detail on something? Have people got updates? Uh, and then obviously seven o'clock is where our, when our program airs, but we try and get everything in by 6.30. It doesn't always happen because there's a whole process of um, legal and editorial checks and so on. So that's a kind of daily rhythm um, mm-hmm. that we have. But as I say, I don't always have that daily rhythm. So for instance, um, the film that I've got going out tonight at 7.30, so you can probably catch it just as we um, finish, um, was filmed in Belfast um, last week, or no, the week before. Um, and that's a sort of seven minute film. And we, we, it was about a very sad story of a 14 year old boy who was found um, dead and in, in very missing in horrific circumstances. And so we spent some time with his family um, filming and that edit took a long time. And there were lots of legal issues that we had to talk about and work out with our with our team here. So that's taken a lot longer. Um, so there wasn't a kind of typical pattern on those days because we could be we could be working kind of um, odd hours and so on and editing um, across a whole day. So it's not typical in that sense. It's very varied. Um, it can be very unpredictable. Um, while we were in Belfast um, filming uh, on this particular story, uh, lots of other things were happening. And so we ended up um, heading up the top of a mountain to cover wildfires. Um, so that was fun. My producer was wearing white trainers, which are now ash covered because he wasn't yeah. expecting to be up there. Um, so it can be very unpredictable, but, um, you know, exciting too. Sure. And how does that work at the, you know, the daily, um, you know, meetings when there are stories breaking or you're discussing stories? How does how does that get allocated? Can you are you involved in selecting and developing your own stories and, and themes? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real mix. I mean, you know, all, everybody who works at Channel 4 News is encouraged and definitely does bring in stories. We're not the kind of programme that waits mm-hmm. for news to happen. You know, we sort of, we do make the news, we talk to people and get exclusive lines um, and interviews uh, and find out things. And so a lot of the time, if you're not doing something on the day, you'll be spending time talking to your contacts, finding out what's going on, um, trying to work up a story or a new um, film idea. Um, and sometimes obviously there is there are events that are happening so there may be a court case that is happening a political event that is happening and you may get sent there um, and those are assigned uh, sometimes that will be based on who has experience in that area who has done that story before or it can just be who can get there easily right um, because so much of, of tv is, is logistics as well um and and sometimes you might find yourself uh doing something that you didn't expect yeah Okay, so you have to be completely versatile and able to move, uh, uh, obviously. And how you've covered some incredibly um, intimate and uh, personal stories um, and interviewed people in some in tragic situations. How do you cope with that? How do you deal with that on a personal level when you're when you're in those situations with those people who are living these extraordinary lives? It's a, it's, a really, it's a really good question. And you know, I sometimes ask myself, God, how, how are we gonna do this? Um, you know, I, I, you know it's, I think it's very important to sort of remain quite calm during interviews, even though sometimes that can be really hard. You know, sometimes I've had interviewees who are crying and telling me about something very tragic, whether it's the loss of a, a child or a parent or a horrific experience. And I've felt tears coming in my eyes, but I, I, I've sort of held back. Um, I remember being in Iraq and speaking to a little boy who was about seven years old and he was telling me in detail uh, all about how his father was was taken and then and, and, and killed by um, ISIS mm-hmm. and I just remember thinking I you know I have, I have no idea well, how we're going to tell the story um, so it, those those moments can be quite difficult but I, I feel really really privileged that people let us in to a, a tiny part of their lives whatever mm-hmm that part of their life is and trust us actually to be able to tell um, their stories. And I, for me, I think the way you get through it is you think of it as a real, um, a real honor, but also a duty to say, I have to do right by this person and make sure that because they've entrusted me with this story and told me about their most intimate and horrific moments that actually I have to get it right and make sure we get every word of what we put out on air um, perfect for their sake. Yeah. yeah, and do you find are you are the team is kind of 
a very supportive group. I mean, are, are you, are you, you talk presumably a lot with the, your colleagues um, yeah. with those, as a support group. Yeah, and I mean, look, journalism, I think, is, is teamwork, but television mm. in particular is huge teamwork. I mean, you know, look, I get all the glory because I'm on screen, but there's a huge army of people that are involved in bringing us to air every night and making sure that it all looks good. Um, you know, whether it's um, the producers who work alongside you, um, mm. the camera crew, the director and, and the, the gallery team, the team of legals, our editor, and there's, there's so many other people involved who, who don't get the credit. Um, and I think it's so important actually to remember it's teamwork and actually that, that that's something you must remember if you want to go into um, TV production of any kind or I guess it's useful for a workplace in general is to really make sure that it's not all about you and that you really do remember that it, you have to work in a team. Yeah, yeah. And, and so looking back to your eight year old self in a way, have you, do you think your work does make an impact? Do you think you have made an impact on some of those issues by telling that story, uh, by telling us what's happening? And, and what, what are you most proud of? Could you talk about a couple of your reports that you're most proud of? Mm. You and your team, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I, like, I like to think so. I like to think it has an impact. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes we will put out a story about an injustice, um, give you an example, something like the ongoing saga with Grenfell Tower and the cladding mm. scandal, which I'm sure lots of you have heard about, which seems to just be ongoing. And the amount of times that I have done interviews or stories with um, survivors and family members of Grenfell Tower um, who still are asking for the same things again and again and again um, and are being sort of dragged through that process I think you know it can be upsetting to see that that hasn't had that impact and you know I can't promise people that when they come on Channel 4 News that they will get what they're what they're seeking like yeah. all I can say is we will give you exposure. We will do everything we can to make sure that your that your story is heard, that the injustice that you're trying to expose is, is listened to, but we can't guarantee that. Um, we're not decision makers in the end. So that's yeah. frustrating. Um, but other times it's, it's amazing to see the impact it, it can make or, you know, whether it's in terms of um, uh, a charity getting in contact with someone because they've seen their plight on, on Channel 4 News or, or you know, someone who's, particularly kind getting in touch or a government policy changing. You know, for instance, um, we did a lot of coverage um, on the Windrush scandal um, and we talked to uh, a lot of people who had terrible stories to tell and there, there was change brought about there and that, and that was great to see. Um, the other, sometimes it's great to see when you're able to expose someone um, who, should, who should be exposed. So for instance, um, in the aftermath of the Brexit referendum, um, we exposed some of the uh, wrongdoing that was going on around the campaign, um, deceiving people. Um, so in particular, I remember that um, there was a gentleman who um, was effectively uh, presenting himself as showing how easy it was to sneak migrants into the UK. And he sort of did a video where he would go over to France and then come back into the UK through Dover and Deal and various other places and see there's no checks. Do you see how easy it is to, to be able to sneak in uh, to England and to the UK? Um, well, our team, our investigative team did an amazing job and found out that that boat had never gone to France and then come back to England, actually filmed it all on separate days. Um, and we were able to confront him with that, which was amazing. And um, it sort of exposed um, some uh, deception that people need to know about. And so it's great when that has an impact too. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take a look at some of the questions coming in now. I'm going to, uh, Mark, Mark's asked if there is one person you could um, interview, um, who would that be and why? That you haven't already, presumably. Oh, Maybe. God, I think that's really hard. I really find these questions hard. Um, I mean, I, you know, to be really boring, I think it would be good to interview the Prime Minister right now. He hasn't made it available <laughs> for an interview for a long time. I obviously have interviewed him uh, before, um, notably on that uh, famous red bus in 2016. Uh, when I said to him, actually, when you're prime minister and Donald Trump is president um, and, and put those words to him and everyone thought it was a bit of a joke then, but turns out that was um, a bit of a prediction. 
certainly does. And that's obviously something that happens in most news. Um, uh, I, that happens most nights, doesn't it? You can't get hold of ministers or government representatives and so on. So I guess that's um, the prime minister or someone from the government uh, mm -hmm. would be quite good to uh, I think interview. That sounds like a boring answer. Maybe I'll try and come up with a better one later if I can. <laughs> and Mark's also um, asked a, a, a very good question, I think. Have you ever had online trolls for doing your job or raising uh, particular issues after a particular interview? Yeah, I mean, it does, it does happen. I mean, um, the block button is our best friend, I think. Um, there's lots of, there's lots of positive messages that I get to, but yes, yes, I do. Uh, and on, on all sorts of things, actually. Uh, sometimes, I, and I do make a distinction between people who have a criticism to make. I think, you know, people want to, to say something negative but in a polite way where they're unhappy about how we reported something or they think we've got something wrong i think that's totally fair and i welcome that i you know i, I engage with people if they do get in contact like that but that's there's, that's different to abuse or being abusive to either me or one of our interviewees um and those people do get blocked um yeah it does happen uh, you know it's not something i would want to focus on because i think it's just a part of life isn't it um and you know i think that um you, you also have to learn when to switch off. That's, I think that's also something that's very important. I mean, we live so much of our lives on social media now, and obviously we've had to more so because of the pandemic. Um, but I think it's very important to know when you've got a day off work that you're gonna not be on Twitter for a bit. Yeah. I mean, moving, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Zubeda Chowdhury, uh, the, um, what about when it gets personal? Are there any, have there been any difficult situations uh, as a visibly Muslim woman? Were you surprised by the Ofcom complaints, you know, at uh, certain points in your career? How do you deal with that when it's it's much more of a personal attack? You mm. sound very well able to deal with it and block it, but that must get difficult. Yeah, I mean, look, not to sound like a politician, the first thing I want to say is, uh, sometimes we do get negativity but honestly nine times out of ten when I go around the country most people who come up to me want to say something really nice and how to say how pleased they are to meet me how how great Channel 4 News is and that's really nice to see and I think that does tell us something um in terms of the negativity honestly the the you sort of mentioned the Ofcom complaints I don't think to my knowledge Ofcom ever had any complaint about me um uh, reporting or presenting the news until it was stirred up um, by a columnist from The Sun, um, mm -hmm. quite famously, which um, some of you will have read about. Um, and this was, you know, when the, when these attacks uh, happened in France, um, yeah. and, I, and John and I happened to be presenting that day. Um, and that's when I started to get a lot of um, hatred off the back of that. And um, I'm told that people complained to Ofcom, but Ofcom found that there was nothing to, to mm -hmm. be upheld there. Um, so I think there, you know, the point is that it was deliberately stirred up by the sun. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, if anyone wants to read more about that, I wrote a whole piece in the Liverpool Echo, which is online. And that's kind of my long rant on the matter. Um, but so I, I think it's quite important to speak out against these things because, yeah. Yes, I, I'm fine and I will be fine. And I have a, a great team of supportive colleagues, um, but I don't want other people to be put off um, from entering a career in journalism or entering public life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's really important that um, uh, ethnic minorities, Muslims, uh, women, whoever you are, you feel that you are able to enter um, the career and the walk of life that you want to and do the very best you can at it without being held back um, by dinosaurs and bigots. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I, I feel it's a responsibility to speak out in those moments. Um, but a lot of the other time, I, yes, I think it's all about just blocking people and uh, moving on from it. Okay, okay. And uh, there's another question here. Have you ever felt like you were employed because of tokenism? And how do you deal with that? I, mean, I hope not you know to get my my job at channel 4 news as i say i had to do three different interviews and um various tests including a, a screen test and putting together a report and so on um so i mean i think that to me that says something uh obviously mm -hmm. i look the way i look and it is television i don't think anyone can deny that i'm sure for some people that matters um but genuinely that's not the way it feels in the channel 4 newsroom 
Um, mm. That's not the way that my editor or my colleagues treat me. Um, we're all, you know, as nice and as rude to each other, regardless of who we are. So I think that that's important. Okay, and um, so I, there's a couple of questions about this, and I wanted to ask this um, earlier. It you do it does feel like an extraordinary team at Channel Four. I mean, both you know behind the camera, but also on camera, the journalists that we see every night. What can you tell us a bit more about what it's like working with them, and you know, and how you know how that feels, you know, because it, it comes across as something that's pretty unique, pretty special, actually, that the kind of bond and the kind of energy that seems to be between you, even when you've been separated over this last year in, in terms of the reporting and so on. Just, can we get a bit more insight to that particular team? I don't, I don't want to be too nice about them because I'm sat here in the Zoom room and they're outside and so they'll take the piss <laughs> on every night. Um, you know, I, I think the difference for working at Channel 4 News compared to other newsrooms that I have experienced is the fearlessness. Um, mm -hmm. it's good work. They are so, I mean, they are so bloody fearless, you know, and I think there's a real kind of can do attitude about the place. You know, when we get a story or we hear about something, it's all about how do we make this happen? How do we expose this? And that's the starting point. And I think that's not the case for all newsrooms. And I don't, I, you know, there's lots of great journalists out there. I don't want to be disparaging about um, other newsrooms, but I think that is the difference. And that's I think that's what our viewers love is the idea that we are not afraid to ask questions of people regardless of how powerful they are regardless of what impact it will have on whether we get access or an interview um unfortunately it's what also upsets um some people about us but you know having that fearlessness i think is a huge part of the culture and the dna of channel 4 news and it's something that i love because it's the kind of journalist that i want to be and uh, try to be to say that regardless of who you are if you've done something wrong we will come after you we will ask you those questions um and we will try and hold you to account because i think our viewers expect it of us um i mean that that is what journalism is about i think but unfortunately it's not what you see in every newsroom and I think that's that's why people sort of draw a distinction between us um and some others and that's what they see I think it's a brilliant word I think that's exactly it yeah it's it is fearlessness and and we have to ask the specific John Snow questions now uh yeah. the time has come yeah can you talk a bit more about what it's like working with John and oh, brilliant he's brilliant I mean it, it, it's been so, honestly su such a pleasure working with him and, and I, like many of you you know I watched him on screen when I was growing up um, and so you know he's a real hero of mine and it's been such an honour to work with him and he's, he's so much fun um, and funny but also very <laughs> kind um, and the other thing that you know I, I keep hearing really lovely stories about him from from viewers and people who've just come across uh, him randomly in some in some place about how kind he's been to them and I think that's of course people will remember his brilliant journalism but I think his kindness and his humanity also really deserves to be remembered and you know we've, we've got him for a few months yet so you know we're, we're, we're really pleased about that but obviously very sad to see him go yeah, I, uh, you must be. Uh, there's another question here saying, um, you know, are there any um, insights into who might replace him? Um, but I'm... If you find out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I'm just going to give everyone who's written up a question a chance for me to read them and um, try and theme them and group them. Um, there's a few questions here going back to our early chats about getting into the industry. So I'm going to just cover these for people. Ben, you've asked um, how, how common, how easy it is to move from print journalism into broadcast journalism. Um, I, I've come across lots of um, uh, print journalists who've moved to broadcast. Um, it, it is fairly common. Um, again, I think it's all about just learning your craft. And when you're a print journalist, it's a different type of craft you learn, but the skills of finding stories, interviews, maintaining contacts, all of that is, is the same. Uh, it's just a question of learning um, the technical skills of TV, which can be, which can be difficult, um, but it's, you know, it's possible. Um, I think th the, the problem is that obviously you will all be very aware is that print journalism is contracting. Mm -hmm. And so it, where you would have a kind of traditional route of people starting out in their local paper and then moving to a national paper and maybe going to a, a television program after that that 
path is not so straightforward now. Mm. Um, however, I think there are alternative paths that have opened up and it's very interesting to me when I go to schools and do kind of school talks, obviously not done that very much recently, but um, seeing how people are sort of telling what's going on in their own neighborhood or their own area or a, a niche area that they're interested in, just using their phones and editing themselves. And also this kind of technical skills that are on display among some of, uh, you know, school children are, are amazing. And so I think, Yes, there is a sort of a closing of, of, of journalism jobs in print, which is troubling. And I think for all of us who think journalism matters, we're, we're troubled by that. But at the same time, I think there is a positive story in terms of people um, being much more skilled technically when it comes to um, producing really high quality video and audio. And mm. you know, we obviously see that with, with you know, podcasts, people just, I mean, we've all been broadcasting from our from our rooms and our homes now haven't we on zoom um yeah. but seeing that kind of technical skill really develop and that's 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 changed the industry it's changed how we um how we behave and you know how we are yeah. able to do things and from what and this is quite a specific um uh, question uh, along the same lines but um it's asking is it uh is it better to uh dive in as it were and get an apprenticeship or is it a good route to go and get a master's do a general degree and then do a bjtc accredited journalism course you know in your view in your opinion it's a hard one to ask you i appreciate Fatima. yeah and it, you know i think i think we we spoke earlier people do have different paths i know people who've, who've done the master's route and done very well at it but i also know people who've learned on the job personally if you asked me you know if i were to do it again i think learning on the job is a very is a very good thing to do um because you are doing it for real there's no theoretical about it um and i think that you know those early experiences can be quite formative and quite um important so you know if if, if it was me starting out right now and i was graduating and i knew what i do know now i would still do the kind of practical route but that's not always straightforward for people i know that there aren't always apprenticeships available yeah um I th you know the key thing here about all of this is to really hone um the journalism you know getting the, the journalistic skills right and, and hone the kind of craft the technical skills the storytelling of however you know whether you want to do radio or tv or podcast to actually to learn those skills and to kind of really get those right before you start doing the more complicated stories um and I think once you sort of have that down it, it, it makes life easier when you're having to do um, complex national or international stories. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so um, uh, Hannah and, and Oscar, I think that uh, that's interesting and useful advice from Fatima about you know multiple routes, but you know grab the opportunity and hone those skills. And I think it's absolutely right to say there are Oscar, there are fewer opportunities now, so it's going to be quite competitive to get onto training schemes or apprenticeships but there are more coming i think there is there are more apprenticeships certainly um being i mean also uh, your student newspapers and student radio stations and so yeah. on i think are, are really great you know you know i think some people think of them as frivolous i don't think of them at all i had a really great time working at my student newspaper we did some really important stories about um you know for instance some that come to mind uh cleaners working conditions at our campus oh. um so you can't you can you can you can break some important stories and sometimes those stories then um attract the attention of of, of your um local or regional press or even your national press so i think that there is an opportunity at university itself yeah and I, th I know the careers team and the the support that the university of york students can get um you know we'll point them in those directions but it's really really helpful to hear it from you as well you know in the field uh, and working with all the other um, professional journalists so moving back to talk about the stories now and the journalism um you know uh, Hannah's asked what's the biggest response that you've ever had from one of your your reports or your team's reports oh gosh um I, I suppose you mean sort of on social media I it's um yeah. We had, I mean, we had lot, lots of response when we, we, you know, we did our investigations around um, Cambridge Analytica and the Leave campaign. There was lots around that. Um, and then it's quite interesting with social media because 
lots of people are interested in small th in one very small thing so you you know you often have segments of society very interested in something and so you get a lot of social media response but actually lots of other people aren't seeing that social media response because we all have our little silos in some ways so that's quite interesting um so sometimes you can be covering something that is considered niche perhaps but a particular section of society is very interested in it and your particular social media timeline um, is sort of um, hit, hit by tweets. Um, and sometimes it can be quite unpredictable. Um, you know, you might just have, have a moment on air or, uh, you know, a particular line or question you asked in an interview and that sparks the attention of someone who, who, who finds it interesting or funny. And then, <laughs> then that, that sort of goes viral. So yeah, it, sometimes it can be unpredictable. Yeah. And um, uh, an interesting question here on fake news and alternative facts. Can you talk a bit more about the editorial positions you take on really contentious stories involving politicians? Because this is something that goes to your point on fearlessness, I think. Mm. Um, and um, contentious stories involving politicians and how far you feel you can challenge them about lying. Mm. And I think, I think, I think we would all agree that that is something that Channel Four needs team does uh, pretty regularly actually but I don't know um, if you want to elaborate on that first of all. Well I think it, I think it's a really really good question um, because we do live in an era as we all know where where people do sort of um, have their own truths as it were and that's made harder when you have people in positions of power um, uh, peddling um, untruths and you know, I think I think that's a challenge. Even you know, for us, well, you know, yes, we are fearless. Yes, we will challenge you if 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 you uh, do something wrong or uh, mislead people. But it can be a challenge um, because you know one of the things that we have to think about is the idea of of, of balance and impartiality, particularly oh, yeah. as a TV news program. Um, uh, I'm conscious it's an election day also, so I don't want to mention any specifics, so we can't really mention any political parties or um, specific encounters. But, um, you know, you do have a, a, a problem when you have a person A saying something and person B saying something and they're from opposing political parties. But you know that what person A has said is untrue. Do you just present them equally? and let the viewer decide or do you say here is what a thinks and here is what b thinks but by the way what a says is factually wrong and i think we have adopted that position in saying yes we'll present it to you but we will also um mm. uh, be clear about where you have um misled people but you know when we're talking about politics that's not always straightforward um so i think you know we we have to be sharper and work harder uh more than ever at getting that right um and, and fake news, I mean, it's a tricky one that because, you know, people talk about the fake news on, on social media and yes, we've all had the kind of weird WhatsApps and um, uh, sort of lies and conspiracy theories that are peddled. Um, and I think that those are quite disturbing, but at the same time, I think it's very important for people to be able to express themselves freely. Um, so getting that balance right is, is very, very, very difficult. And I think, the one thing that we sort of um, uh, take solace from, I would say, is that we like to think that if we get things right, people will come to us and trust us um, and, and that we are a trusted source of journalism. Um, mm. And that does count for something so mm. that people do distinguish between the weird WhatsApp that your grand sends you compared to something that you have um, watched on Channel 4 News, that there is still a distinction made um between those things but i think it, i think as i say i think it's a really good question it's something that all newsrooms and all of us really are still um uh, trying to navigate and get right yeah yeah i mean and this is a you know to to credit other questioners here you know uh, gracie Dawes raised the uh, question about the importance of impartiality impartiality in reporting news which you've just talked about a little bit Lucy Wilde, you mentioned something else about this earlier, Fatima. She's talking about the rise of social media and tabloid journalism and the growth of mistrust and suspicion that kind of permeates across the profession. Um, and, you know, how do you think this can be tackled? Um, that's that I think I, 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 that's a difficult one, actually. Mm. Um, how can it be tackled? Well, we need more money to go into good journalism so that the people with the most money who are funded by uh, billionaires who don't even live in the UK um, peddling their ideological agendas aren't the only people being hurt. 
we need more we need more money in good honest holding to people account journalism um and i think that's the only way that you will counter it but also for people to speak out um when we see open i'm not talking about you know you disagreeing politically with a with a tabloid i'm talking about um uh, open bigotry and hatred when that's when that's peddled i think it's very important that people speak out um and and vote with their feet too also you know um at the end of the day these are businesses mm. and if they see that something is not profitable they're not going to continue doing it um so that's something to bear in mind yeah and what do you think about the role of regulation as well i mean uh and that extending i suppose as well as more uh, resource you know to support the you know the profession um and the integrity of the profession what about regulation you know that will actually have teeth have you got views on that uh, well i mean look i work for regulated media we have ofcom and mm -hmm. You know we have to make sure we are impartial and fair and accurate and it hasn't stopped us being fearless in our journalism mm -hmm. so i don't see why it would stop other outlets doing so um obviously you have to balance that up with um freedom of speech and the other thing that i think is good about the uh, the british um journalistic tradition is that kind of sense of fun um yeah. i think it's important to preserve um yeah. we wouldn't want to lose that in any way so i think you know, at the end of the day, it's possible, but um, I'm sure that there would be a way to balance those things and it would be great to, to, to see that. Well, I'm really tracking through the questions now and I hope I've captured most of the key questions about getting into the industry and the, the, the dilemmas and the difficulties around uh, reporting balance and impartiality. Um, I think there's still uh, <laughs> Do you think we will ever live in a world where rich billionaires don't own most of our press? Is the final, is a, a, another late question from Hannah? I don't know. I mean, I I'm an optimist. I, I'd say yes. Yeah. Well, let's let's leave the um, audience questions on that note of optimism, that note of um, absolute clarity about the role of. Uh, you know, broadcaster like Channel 4 and reporters like Fatima and her colleagues. And I just wanted to just give you one last question, if, if you could, and you've left trails throughout the whole hour, but if you could just give advice, just maybe even one piece of advice to someone who's hoping to get into your field, what would that be? Hmm. Um, I think take every story seriously even if you think it's um you know too small not quite interesting enough not quite glamorous enough take take it all seriously um because you never know where it will end up or where uh, the person telling you that story will end up um and honestly i i you know i've um found really interesting pieces of information um uh, and come across interesting stories just from small conversations with people unexpectedly um even very recently um while i was uh when we were we were filming someone um and we were getting what we call the setup shots which is just pictures of the person and i talking so we can introduce them we're both sat on a bench and while and so it really doesn't matter what you talk about there you can just have small talk but while i was talking to this person they made me aware of something else that was very interesting and important and another story which we hope to be bringing to you soon so um you know you can you can find out all kinds of interesting uh, information just by just by talking to people and kind of keeping an open mind about these things um so i think that that's um something i i hope i can share with you all that is fantastic as has been everything else you said tonight fatima thanks a million Thank you. um for fitting this into an incredible um uh life um and quite frankly i don't know how how you do fit it all in, but thank you for being so generous with your time, with your advice, and actually an inspiration to lots of the uh, audience we can't see, and it's so frustrating. I know, it's very, it's very weird, but I mean, it's just so weird, guys. Smiling, and you've enjoyed it. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's 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 been great talking to you, Kate, and thanks to Joan, Caitlin, and the whole team 
you know it, it takes a real army of people to put these events together so real tribute to you for doing it and i hope that we'll be able to to see all of the students in person soon that would be great oh wouldn't um, it must it will just be yeah. great and for them to see each other but, yeah. but i think before we go i'm going to hand over to to matthew actually yeah. to matthew king who's going to say a few words he's the editor of news uh, news um, and one of the student publications at the university. I don't know if I pronounced that right, actually, well, Matthew. Before but... you hand over to Matthew, can I just very quickly plug something myself? Is that all right? Yes. I keep getting to do this and my publisher keeps telling me to do it I, if you want to hear more from me it's not about journalism it's about um, museums and galleries across Britain I've also written a book called Hidden Heritage and it's out on August 12th but you can pre-order it now so if anyone's interested in hearing anything more from me please please have a look um, at your local uh, bookseller or online um, if you'd like to order but um, that's just a little plug cheeky plug from me definitely thank you very thank much you. Matthew over to you to news hi everyone yeah um, yeah, so before I start doing some more uh, housekeeping things, just want to first of all say thank you to our speaker Fatima, thank you for coming in, and our chair Kate, it's been really great to see you two conversing the way you have. Um, I've got some final housekeeping notes just to kind of say before we end, so if you'd like to watch this again or share the event with friends or colleagues or anyone else you think might be interested, the recording will be available um, on YouTube. Um, on the York Ideas YouTube channel, which can be accessed by typing York Ideas in YouTube into Google. However, uh, just allow a couple of days um, for that to appear. Um, obviously, this year has been, I'd say, the worst uh, year for students. I think there's no one that would disagree with me when I say that. Um, uh, and whilst, but whilst it's been a challenging time for students, I think uh, entering the employment world and the kind of the, the marketplace, events such as this one have just been so great to give us a fascinating insight into the really diverse range of careers that are available. Um, I think something you said, Fatima, kind of more at the beginning, but then kind of again, more at the end was kind of this idea that, you know, you didn't study journalism at university. And that's been something uh, I've had a bit of kind of personal anxiety over because obviously I do English, um, but obviously I'm very active in the paper as editor. And I've got a, you know, a fantastic team of uh, about 50 odd uh, editors who I'm assuming a lot of them want to go into journalism I'm assuming they also have this kind of anxiety of you know not studying journalism but kind of still wanting to be in it so it was really great to kind of hear you um, talk about that how that's not necessary and kind of learning on the job um, so thank you for that um, so yeah just to round up uh, if you enjoyed tonight's event you may also be interested in why what happens off screen matters on Wednesday 16th of June which will feature our chair from this evening, Kate, uh, discussing the importance of diversity on and behind our screens with a panel. Uh, details of this event can be found on the screen now, um, as well as copied into the Zoom chat below if you wanna check that out. Um, we very much hope that you will continue to engage with our upcoming behind the scenes events, details of which can be found on the website, so york.ac.uk slash events, together with a full listing of this term's open lectures. For more information on the upcoming York Festival of Ideas program, please visit yorkfestivalofideas.com. So now the only thing that I've got left to say is again, thank you to Kate and Fatima once again, and to thank you, the audience, for joining us and listening. Thank you very much, and we hope you have a very good evening.